grognards of the day, you know, wouldn't have any of that L nonsense. Yeah. So, get that away from my table. I'm Napoleon. This week on Backward Compatible, veteran game designer Nathaniel Torson joins us to discuss the challenges and potential of hybridizing digital and analog games. Plus, Jim plays MGS5 Ground Zeroes and Chris talks Darkest Dungeon. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 38 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined by Jim. I'm here, and I'm ready to mosh. <laughs> and uh, Doc is unfortunately not with us today. He's got a, a family trip. Young Ian Bracken just turned one over the weekend, so they were uh, el- elsewhere visiting family. Uh, but instead, we have Nathaniel Thorson with us today. Nathaniel, how about you introduce yourself? Uh, my name's Nathaniel. Uh, I work at iStation, uh, where I'm a technical editor sort of a combination of script writer, translator uh, for technical, uh, for, for educational games, mm. actually. Uh, I am a graduate of the University of North, uh, University of North Texas, and my master's was at the University of Dallas, in, uh, Texas of Dallas, uh, where I graduated with you guys. Yep. Mm-hmm. We all know each other. We've <laughs> known each other for a long time. Old school mates. Yeah. Uh, great. I guess we might as well go ahead and jump right into the button mosh. Let's jump into the mosh. Wah. Ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. Alright, well I've been playing recently uh, Metal Gear Solid Ground Zeroes. I recently, or finally, got a chance to play it. Um, actually, I was pretty excited to play it when it when I, when I it first were first announced, but I didn't really have a chance to. I had too much other stuff going on. Sure. Um, I gotta say, I heard some people were a little bit disappointed in terms of the length and in terms of... Um, a lot of the, the the little bit of story that you got, but I thought it was actually excellent. I mm. really enjoyed it. Um, the The gameplay is much improved over what I remember from the oh, Metal Gear series. Yeah, I no, mean, the the gameplay refinements are awesome. Yeah, it's thing. it's a lot more. It's they make it so immersive now because they get rid of the codec and mm. all all the little um, indicators on the screen, aside from you know the little triangles when you uh, mm. mark mark another enemy, mm-hmm. but. I love how they have the the, uh, the flashlights or spotlight little little symbol that sort of like the, the, that kind of glare that almost blinds you when mm-hmm. you start to be possibly spotted and the way that they sort of it, they, it's very clear if you've been spotted if you've been uh, spotted by an enemy mm-hmm. without it actually outright like telling you or putting a little exclamation point over mm-hmm. your head like they used to do oh, like the like first mark. couple yeah. yeah question mark if like they don't if they oop do they see you mm-hmm. they make it clear with do a lot of audio and visual cues right. Um, I really got into the gameplay, and yeah, the the the, um, the cutscenes, some of them, especially early on, were very long. Mm-hmm. But I really was getting into the story too. I'm pretty excited. Of course, the last the last mm-hmm. cutscene, and then uh, obviously the scene right after it, where it was just the trailer, mm-hmm. it's pretty mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say, I'm very excited about. Um, it'll, just talking about it again is giving me goosebumps. I love Is it. John DiMaggio still doing the voice for uh, for that series? Uh, it was David. It Hader. was David Hader, oh, okay. um, and he is not. It's actually now uh, Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland. Sutherland. Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Kiefer and Kiefer is uh, actually does a good job. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I still would say. I mean, I like Hader. I understand why because uh, you know, Big Boss is getting older. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it makes a little bit more of a sense to have a different sort of voice for him. I mm-hmm. understand because he, he had a totally different voice actor at the um, spoilers at the end of four when he reappears. Yeah. Was he was he Kiefer? Was that Kiefer in Final no, Four? I didn't because I didn't think so. Mm-hmm. Okay, do you know? I what swear, it is? John DiMaggio is in well, that maybe, somewhere. I saw. It. Not sure. I wouldn't be surprised if he does a voice in that game because I'm pretty sure that it's like some sort of a, a law that he does a voice in every single game <laughs> and like animation animated adaptation. Right. But um, no, he played he played Jake the dog in Metal Gear Solid. Um, or am I thinking of the same guy? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so Chris, you've played Ground Zero. I have. Did, what did you think of it? Um, so actually, I think the length was pretty good. Now, to it, be it, fair. It, I, I, take you I did the first one. I, I didn't like pay for an hour and a half, or about an hour. And a half. Well, I got yeah. it for free on PSN. It yeah. was free for this month. Right, yeah, yeah. That's why I played. So I, I did pay for it, but I think I got it <laughs> discounted. Um, 
And so, you know, I, I didn't have the same complaint as some people because I can understand if you paid forty dollars for that, you might be feeling a little bit was ripped it, off. Was it really forty when it first came I think, out? I thought it was twenty. I think for PS4 it was. Um, really? It might have been less on PS3. Okay. I, I paid nothing because <laughs> yeah. I have a Wii U and they, yeah. <laughs> they don't they don't make it for Wii U. No, so fair enough. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I thought that the uh, the length was sufficient. I really loved the. Uh, and they have the extra missions too. The little VR. Yeah. Wait, I hadn't even started those, mm-hmm. so I think the length is going to be fine. Yeah, especially if you want to go back and do everything on hard too. Um, yeah. Because I've tried a little. Oh bit of God, it that that would that's going to be so annoying when I try that. <laughs> I love I love the series and I love the presentation, but I have to be in the right mindset to mm-hmm. play it, which is why I waited so long. Right. Because if you're if you're if, if you're the mindset and you're kind of frustrated, and you just want to go through and like, you know kill people you mm. don't play Metal Gear Solid you have mm. to play stealthy and patient to be and fair though they have you, you they have can. made it that's true easier in this one to go run and gun if you want to yeah yeah I can see that because I there was there was this one time where I thought I was was found out and I did sort of do a little run and gun section uh, section before I was able to hide mm. and then sort of recompose myself and go hide the bodies mm. and it, it worked out okay I was actually pretty surprised I actually I love the operations aspect of it the idea that you have to call in your helicopter and that sort of thing yeah um, because what ended up happening and you could do it different points too yeah. which is great but, right? yeah and you can even like throw um a flare actually to do it wherever you yeah. want um but what was really neat about it is the first time i played it and when you play it for the first time you don't know the world like it, the map's open world you can still learn it especially over the course of all these missions yeah um but when you don't know where you're going and what you're doing and you're just kind of like trying to sneak your way through and it's a more deliberate pace really felt awesome mm. um but i remember I, I sneaked through most of the time until i got to my objective and then i had to basically go guns blazing to get out and so it's this really cool like the music starts kicking up and you're waiting for the helicopter to come and it's doing a few like you know gunning runs strafing runs before but, it can pick you up that's sort of James Bond all, all hell breaks loose yeah, so it's great. I mean, it, it was really awesome that's, that's Snake I mean if you haven't played the series uh, Snake I, whether we're talking about Solid Snake or, 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 or uh, Naked Snake Big Boss mm-hmm. he's basically James Bond and um, oh, I lost my train of thought he's James Bond and Rambo there we go rolled into <laughs> one he's essentially he's the perfect spy the perfect soldier rolled into one would you agree with that that statement sure yeah, yeah. so I mean he, that's, that's one of the things that makes him so cool that's, that and he has an excellent voice. And, and for those that were wondering, we do have an extra surprise guest today. It is David Hayter. Why don't you say something for us there, David? <clears throat> What's up? No. Not oh, come on, Chris. <laughs> you were so great. In, in the, in the, I, I need, in the I need time it. to warm up. It's like, <laughs> I'm not David Hayter. There you go. <laughs> that was not bad. Um, uh, I, have to, I have to warm up a little bit before you get there. <laughs> That's fine. So, so uh, Nathaniel, have you played Metal Gear Solid, the series? Or you're aware of the series, I assume. Uh, yeah, I've never been one for uh, run and gun sorts of games. It's not right? run and gun at all. Well, no, I, I understand. I understand yeah. that. But uh, uh, I've been more for like we played Goldeneye when I was in college on the sixty four. Right. Yeah. So, FPS. Yes. Uh, yeah, we did that. And then we horrible did game. If I can interject in the mosh, if you go back and it is horrible. It's actually, not sold up well. Actually, you know what? What's more horrible? <laughs> the new Goldeneye is actually terrible. Also it's, true. Also it starts true. off yeah. as, like you said, mm-hmm. it's you sneak in and then all hell breaks loose, yeah. uh, like that first mission. <laughs> and then next thing you know, you're in an airport and doing a shooting gallery. It's, yeah. it's absolutely ridiculous. That, that is the one thing about the 007 games is that they are very much like it's a much more shooty take on 007 than the, it, and the, any of the movies it, it ever. It doesn't were. work at all. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think if you're into the sort of like into the spy game, you're better off playing Metal Gear Solid because it's more... That's what it focuses on. It is it is a spy game, and it has that action, too, just like just like Bond. Bond has the, the, the slower spy infiltration tactical moments, and he's got the odd action moments, and Metal Gear Solid, I think, does a good balance. Well, you sold me. See, now i got to play the game. I've never played the game because it always looked to me like just another first-person shooter. Not, not even never, close. I yeah. think if... It's, this, and this, also, this if you one, like narrative, it's... it's of course, I'd have to get something besides a Wii U to play it. So. Yeah. Well, the earlier it's on PC ones. too. So <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Oh, cool. And, I and the earlier, Steam sale or the Gun Zeroes, is, I should say. Yeah. So. And the earlier ones, like um, the first one, was on. Let's see, uh, PlayStation. It mm-hmm. had the remake on um, the Wii. Mm-hmm. No, I'm sorry, the GameCube, which you can also play on the Wii. Um, Metal Gear Solid Two was on the PS2, the Xbox. I think it also had like versions on the PS3. And then uh, Metal Gear Solid 3 was on the 3DS, as well as, of course, PS2, Xbox, all that. Metal Gear Solid 4 is only on the PS3. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, like if you have like old PS2, you can play all of them on there, technically. No, we had a PS1 when we sold it, uh, because do you have uh, a, just recently. Do you actually. have a 3DS? Do you have a no. 3DS? Oh, well, no. so you can play Snake Eater. Snake Eater is my favorite. Mm-hmm. Uh, 3DS is a great system, by the way. No, th- 
I, I really do have to say, I think Snake Eater's probably my favorite, but mm-hmm. we'll, we'll save that for a Metal Gear Solid life. <laughs> yeah, though. eventually we need to have the Metal Gear Solid episode. And we can have crazy conspiracies about, like, the Metal Gear characters on it. But, um, okay, so let's let's uh, move right along. Um, Nathaniel, do you have any games that you've been playing recently? I've been playing a lot of games, again, on the Wii U with my son. Now, one of the reasons I got a Wii U is, uh, first of all, I'm not a big console gamer. Never really have been mm-hmm. since the 64. I, I, I got the Dreamcast and played those really weird sort of, uh, mm-hmm. you know... Out there games like Seaman, yeah, and stuff like that. That was uh, that was. I don't know if I'd call you call that a game, but it was interesting. It was an interesting experience. It left me hanging. Damn it! The the, the, the thing turned into a frog and hopped <laughs> off. And yeah. every once in a while, I'll turn on the game and maybe he'd he peek and say, "Hey, how are you doing? Oh my!" You know, he sounds like George Takai. Oh, uh, the oh my! I'm a frog. I ate all my kid. That'd be a great movie. A video game, a video game film. Yes. George Takai is C-Man. <laughs> Actually, there's way too many connotations to that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, back to what I was saying. Children, uh, I actually play with my four-year-old son. I got him a Wii U uh, because it's got a lot of family games on it, yeah. and that's why I, I bought it. You know, I don't need something like the PS3 or PS4 or the Xbox One, Xbox One because most of those games are shoot 'em, kill 'em, or zombie mm-hmm. this or you know whatever. Yeah. But with uh, Wii U, I get you know all these Mario games, Sonic games, mm, yeah. uh, a lot of racing games that are really cool. They have some really good games on the Wii U, definitely. Oh yeah, but the one game I absolutely cannot stand at this point is uh, Super Mario World 3D, uh, for various reasons. <laughs> is that is that Super Mario 3D 3D World? Uh, no, I, it's called Super Mario World 3D. Actually. No, I think it's 3D World actually. It's 3D, 3D World, it, it's, is it? Kind of, it's like this sort of like top-down slash isometric sort of thing. Yes, where you can, where you run around and you can play up with up to four people. And yeah, you, and you play as like uh, Mario. Okay. See, I hate this game so Coder. much. I can't even remember the title. <laughs> and and the reason I dislike it, it's not because Mario's dressing up as a furry every five minutes. <laughs> it's it, it's it, that doesn't bother me as much. It's not the kind of repetitive gameplay that you get from Mario games these <laughs> days. Uh, because I played so many Mario games, yeah. it's really hard to make that thing no, liven think, it up. I think 3D World did a great job of, of sort of revitalizing some of those mechanics. It actually has one good thing, and that is once you beat the game, which my son has done like three times, mm-hmm. he's four, he's beat the game three times. Wow. Uh, you go up to space, and so it's got this whole another mm-hmm. set of levels and stuff. But the thing that drives me nuts is the multiplayer, because, um, and 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 I and I know I'm playing with a four year old is part of the problem, but if the person that you're playing with is constantly running forward, mm-hmm. ever forward and never stopping, you mm-hmm. find yourself in a bubble like seventy five oh, yeah, percent of the time. Yeah. Especially if you're playing a slower character. So, you know, I wanna look in trees, I wanna hit boxes and stuff like that. And he's like <laughs> he's gone, right? He's he's tearing ass down the road. Mm-hmm. And kind of uh, had the same problem with uh, what was the name of it, that dungeon game? Um, Gauntlet, Gauntlet, right? And yes, when we all tried to play, we played Gauntlet for a round table, uh, the new Gauntlet that came out recently, yeah. as three player, and we were trying to get through that. It was um, you, me, and Richard. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, I mean, Chris. Yeah. Um, and Richard, and we had a lot of trouble with that because you had to be in the same screen at the same time. So there was a lot of like pushing. I know at one point I got stuck inside one of the rooms because they had moved <laughs> forward and I couldn't get down because yeah. the down was no longer available. And I was stuck in there with like a bunch of enemies. And I, I mean, I died. They killed me essentially. Well, it's worse in Mario it world. <laughs> yes, totally. Yeah. It's worse in Mario world. Cause they put you in a bubble. Your, your butt's floating around over everything. Yeah. You're trying to catch up. And if they happen to get killed while you're in that bubble, which four year old son, he's always doing crazy things, right. jumping off things. So on and so <laughs> forth. It's just like basically seventy five percent of the game. I'm 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 a bystander. Sure. Yeah. Uh, in, in a game I'm supposedly playing. Mm-hmm. So that drives me nuts. Whoever did that multiplayer needs to needs to reconsider their profession. In my yeah. opinion. That that sort of like one screen for four people type of multiplayer is definitely tricky. Um, I think it, it tends to work better because I've actually played a bit of multiplayer with you know people over the age of 17 um and it tends to work pretty well there um you still run into a few issues where like if one person's hanging back they kind of have to do the bubble thing but for the most part uh everyone's kind of able to keep pace with each other um and when that's happening it's actually a lot of fun so well the other problem i have with it is and and i don't want to i don't want to pull the millennial stick out again because <laughs> you know it's 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 it seems to be not just younger people but older people as well these days mm-hmm. video games have I have to preface this with saying I'm 43 years old and I grew up uh, in the era of Space Invaders, Pac-Man. Everything was an arcade. When you spent a quarter, that was that was a significant amount of money you spent as sure. a kid. Yeah, 
and you try to get as milk as much play out of that as possible. And the games were very simple, but they were also ridiculously hard. Mm-hmm. Okay, in some cases because they want your quarters. Because they want your quarters, and and games kept that sort of mentality for the longest time. But in the two thousands, the one thing I've noticed about gaming, both analog and digital, is there are so many ways to 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 get around all that. And in, in the Mario world, there's the stupid feather. If you don't beat the thing twice, if you don't beat a level like two times in a row, the third time they give you access to this feather, it makes you invulnerable. Yeah. So you just, as long as you don't jump off something mm-hmm. and kill yourself, you just. And I've I've heard that as a as a criticism for those games. And while I agree that it is very cheap, it's also optional. You don't have to use it. Oh, well, that's true. So that it's. True. And if you're like you know seven and playing by yourself, and you just get stuck on a hard. Well, level, you know no, that's. That's no excuse. If you're if you're three or four, okay. When I was seven, I was I, I can tell you right now, my seven year old self would school me at just about any game because I was excellent. I don't have the time. If you're in your seven, you have the time to sit there and the time and the patience to sit there for hours and hours yeah, and hours and true. hours and get so freaking good. I forget how old I was. I think I was around that age, me seven, eight, nine, um, when I first played uh, Super Mario World at my grandparents' house because yeah. they had a SNES and I didn't have any. Consoles, and you probably so. owned it. I, I did. I actually, I, what I did is I got to the end of the game not by clearing all of it. By using the Star Road, yeah. Um, and then when I got to Bowser, I can never beat Bowser. I remember I spent like the last two days of our vacation just trying over and over again to beat Bowser, and I never could. And then actually to this day, I still haven't actually done it. I've seen it played, and oh, I really? figure I probably could. I just haven't sat down and See, done it. But in so. those old days, you you had so many tries, and then it was back to the beginning with you. Yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. you learned this, it. Yeah, you learned you it. You learned it when I. I mean. Did all those, all those NES games, all, the, all, all the old uh, Nintendo games that I used to play, that I would play through, that I some of them I don't have the patience for anymore. I would go through and I'd beat all these games that are now considered so crazy, so very hard, and they were hard. Yeah. Things like you know, like Ninja Gaiden or like Metroid or you know Zelda Two. You know, uh, these are games that are considered pretty damn hard, and it, or like you know Life Force and like Radius and all these kind of games. They're hard games, but. You can beat them. They're beatable games. You just have to sit there and play them and learn all the patterns. Exactly. And you really don't have to do that with, like that with Mario World 3D because <laughs> yeah. it's it's it, it, you lose all your, your guys. <laughs> you get a whole bunch of new guys. You're right back yeah. where you start. You, you, you don't go back to the I, beginning. I, True. Yeah. I will say if you want a challenging Mario experience on um, a 3D Mario experience, um, Super Mario Galaxy, particularly Super Mario Galaxy 2 on the Wii, which, of course, the Wii U, the Wii U does play Wii games. Um, yeah. Super Mario Galaxy 2 was sort of like some of those levels in there were it was basically levels from Super Mario Galaxy they couldn't quite fit in but a lot of them come across almost as like a, almost like a hard mode of the original Galaxy you've played Galaxy 2 right? not all the way through it really yeah. does come across as like a hard mode in, in some ways doesn't it? Yeah. I mean I'm not going to say it's super crazy hard mm-hmm. but it but it has a I think a good challenge level for a Mario game it is, it is single player by the way so it's it is a single well, player Mario. Mario but Kart. I recommend you get like for example for for your son if you know if he wants to sit there and play like a Mario game or something because the graphics still look great he might have a really great time playing. playing oh, Galaxy. he loves this one. I'll let him play it. I just won't play it with him because it's <laughs> yeah. the most annoying experience on earth. And Mario Kart had uh, there's a point where yeah you you can you can play the easy stuff, but there were rewards for oh, playing yeah. the harder yeah. stuff, and that's why I love Mario Kart because mm-hmm. in every iteration it's been superb about challenging you know, like stupid Rainbow Road and space yeah. that yeah. thing. Have God. you uh, have you played so, it yet? Huh? Have you played eight on the Wii U? I have played it, but we don't own it yet yeah, because okay. I've been saving up to get him other stuff like another controller. Have you been yeah. able to try two hundred CC by any chance? Uh, no, that kicks my butt. Yeah, it is no, extremely I, hard. I am so bad. I love Mario Kart. I am terrible at it. I am like one of the worst. In fact, driving games in general, I've always sucked mm. at driving games. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just because when I grew up, I didn't really play them much, so mm. I have like almost nothing to build off of. But. It just I'm terrible at driving at, at any sort of like the kart racing driving games. Anyway, um, so let's let's go ahead and move along. Chris, what have you been playing lately? So I've been trying out uh, Darkest Dungeon, uh, which is currently an early release um, or early access game. It's still under development, mm. um, but the idea is that it's it's kind of got the the gameplay base, if you will, of a JRPG, where you've got like a four person party and they're kind of just lined up, and you've got you know usually up to four enemies that you're fighting. Um, but the twist on the formula is that it's this very sort of gritty, dark game thematically. And what will happen is you, your characters have these two different, um, basically, vitality stats. There's their health, and then there's their stress. And if their stress goes up too high, they actually will take on afflictions. Mm. Um, things like personality quirks that will come through just under stress, like you kind of break a little bit. So Warhammer. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, I haven't played much Warhammer, <laughs> yeah, I was, so I'm not I was sure. going to ask, what, what kind of stress? Are we talking like... 
horror type elements? Like, yeah, like but, a sanity type thing? Yeah, or are we talking yeah. like stress is in your body is taking no, it's Stress. more like torchbearer, hunger, okay. and fear. Yeah, or yeah. Something like that. Um, yeah, like okay. some, someone might become afraid, and they might take a couple. Uh, t- like when it's their turn, instead of being able to give them a command, they might not do anything, or um, they might hmm. become. Uh, oh, what's the? I forget the, the term for it. But there's one character. Like an interesting little story I had is um, two of my party members got killed, and they, they can die super quickly, especially in the early game if you haven't leveled them up. And how many party um, members do you have? Four. But that being said, you can recruit new ones. Right. Yeah. Just four. Yeah, I noticed that okay. they've got that whole. You know, back. Back in the day when we played campaigns, people would go in and out of the campaigns, right. and they'd be just assume if they weren't with you on this trip, they were in town mm. healing or resting right. or blowing their money or whatever. Or, or dead. Or dead, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Probably, um, probably dead. But yeah, so you can sort of like, you, you build up a, a town around your estate. That's the other interesting thing, actually, uh-huh. is that it's not like save the world sort of stuff. Uh-huh. It is reclaim your estate that's been ruined because you basically had an uncle who was rich and bored hmm. and opened a portal to hell. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that always happens. As they're wont to do. Yeah. Yes. Frickin' uncles, right? Uh, no, or d- something like that. And then leaves it to you in a will. Yes. Yeah, he yeah, killed himself and said, so, take back what's ours. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what dry, That's what that meant causes you all the stress or like demons coming out of the portal well, so, essentially yeah well so like you're, you're fighting these enemies and I haven't seen many demons yet but there are like um, like elements of the occult mm-hmm. um, there are like you know monsters that come up and sometimes just bandits and thugs and that sort of stuff um, but as you're fighting it's it's like you'll take damage and sometimes actually some attacks are just meant to deal stress damage and not actual damage um, and if you take too much stress um, you start taking on these quirks, which can really mess with your game plan. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is like Torchbearer. Yeah, yeah. Like you, um, you can't sleep. At, the game. You can't mm-hmm. sleep at night. Yeah. You start to eat too much. And it's like, like putting on weight. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like like, like like Torchbearer. Um, you do have to like come prepared with supplies, and so like if your torches run out, things become harder as it gets darker. Mm-hmm. But their reward also goes up. Um, so you want to keep your torches stocked so you can keep the keep things manageable. Um, but like the sort of going back to the story that I was mentioning real quick. Um, two of my party members died, and the two that were left i think one was a paladin and one was a uh, man of arms um and the man in arms had this trait that basically I, I needed to retreat because i was getting my butt kicked in this one fight and i wanted to just like save these two and get the hell out um but he refused to retreat because it's like no i'm not retreating you can't interrupt like a, a master tactician in the middle of a stratagem and i'm like oh lord <laughs> so <laughs> this guy's gonna die and then the other one um was kind of like on this thing where uh like he would occasionally l- refuse to listen to my commands because it hadn't been ordained, essentially. Um, and so what happened is even after the man at arms died, it's like, okay, you're the only one left. You can probably run. The first time I tried to get him to run, it's like, no, I, I cannot run or something like that. It's like, oh my God, everyone's going to die because they're being stubborn. <laughs> now that being and said, when, like, you, when you, you keep saying you and you weren't ordained, mm-hmm. are you a character as well that's part of this party? You are kind of the... You're not in the party, but you're commanding the party. And but they know that you're commanding like the party or it, it, it's kind of like a weird sort of thing. You're definitely a character in the sense that you're the one who's hiring them and you're the one who is okay. kind of managing everything. Um, but I think it's also kind of implied that when they go off to do their own thing, um, you're acting as them kind of it's I don't know, it's kinda of like the same hmm. thing you run into typical RPGs where like you're giving commands but you're not really sure if it's just supposed to be in the fiction them acting on their own. That sort of deal. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, the whole That's, gods acting through no, their I, pawns sort of thing. Right. And, yeah, I, and, I, sense, yeah. and I get that. I was just curious how, you know, it apparently gets pretty meta when it's saying you are not ordained. Well, it's, you try it, to give them orders. What they said is it is not ordained or like the light has not ordained that action or something oh, like that. Okay. So implicitly it could be that, yeah, I, um, or theoretically it could be that like he was thinking about doing that and saying, no, I shouldn't do that. That sort of thing. So essentially, it's it's like these old you know old style RPGs, like something like maybe like a Might and Magic that kind of thing. Only the party members sort of have a little mind of their own, and they sometimes don't do what you want them to do. Is that a good comparison? So, yeah, yeah, I'd say so. That's um, actually a contrast to what, the way games have been going the last ten years, mm-hmm. which is much much more player. Uh, player control, player control, and, yeah. and you know, you're all, you're always super heroic. Like they, they yeah, actually exactly. like a lot. They actually have like sort of a narrator voice that will um, make a commentary uh, on what's happening. And so like you know, you hit you hit a critical blow, and they'll say something about like, 
um, like, you know, spirits are lifted as, like, the enemy crumbles before them or something like that. <laughs> um, but they'll also say a lot of things like, uh, you know, off- overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer and stuff like this. Like, yeah. like some really interesting sort of, like, dark commentary. So hmm. it's definitely trying to get across a very um, gritty, dark tone. More um, of a sword and sorcery vibe, Fritz mm-hmm. Lieber, Howard, uh, Robert Howard, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I definitely recommend checking it out. Um, you what can system? get it uh, PC. PC. I'm not sure if it's on anything else. Okay. Um, and you don't need a big video card to win it, right? Because it's all 2D it, it's graphics. 2D, right. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I might actually check that out. It sounds interesting. Yeah, no, I, I did, I, Richard actually turned me on to when it first cool. came out. And I grabbed it, but hadn't had a chance to play it until recently. And hmm. very glad I have started. It's really, really a neat little game. Cool. All right. Well, uh, let's move right along here. Um, we've got a, uh, a new segment, a uh, shorter segment uh, that we're going to debut today, which is called uh, Nostalgia Trip. Let's all go on a nostalgia trip to see what we can learn from games of the past. Essentially, when one of us has gone out and we've played like an older, an older game, a retro game, we come back in and we do a little quick report on it, or we say things that maybe we had missed the first time, or possibly have a new insight into the game, or want to mention something that maybe we think a modern game can learn from this old game. So uh, I, I, have a, I went on a nostalgia trip a few days ago, and I played the original Metroid for the NES, um, and... I do have a report back, and it, it's it's one of those things where Metroid is, is when I was growing up was one of my my favorite games because of the exploration aspect. It's one of the earlier um, experiments in in kind of an open world adventure. You can kind of go anywhere and sort of set your own pace. You could go left. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can go left, right, up, or down. I mean, you can yeah. go all over the place, and the game really does get, give you these options. You can get to any of the um, uh, the areas. I mean, you do have to get missiles. Kind of, but mm. there are a few things that you sort of need, but you can get to, uh, except for the final area, Tori, and you can get to any of them um, pretty much from the start, mm. you know, because you get the, the, the morph ball right away, instead mm. of right there. Um, so I think, if I'm going to say what the game, what I was impressed with the game, again, I do think that unlike the other, the later Metroid titles, um, the original has this almost survival horror feel to it, mm. because you're so... You're in this. You really feel like you're in this foreign environment, and you feel like you're un, you're un, not um, unarmed, but under underarmed, mm-hmm. underprepared for what you're going to face. And you don't really know where to go, and you're not really given a whole lot of instructions. So it's very much um, you're expected to figure things out for yourself, and and less you feel less like even though you do have an overall mission, you feel less like you're there to save the world per se, as you are to survive in this environment long enough to complete your mission. Mm-hmm. Um, that was something that I felt it still did very well, and I still felt that um, that suspense and that kind of fear. Um, I, I do know that it was sort of a little bit inspired by the very first Alien movie, and you can still kind of feel that when you mm-hmm. play the game. Um, that said, I will say that there were elements of the game that I didn't really like. Um, the controls were kind of clunky, floaty, yeah. a more so than I remember. Mm-hmm. Um, the level design is very repetitive, and, I, and a lot of that is because of the limitations. This was one of the earlier um, games on the uh, Famicom Disk System, and unlike, for example, Legend of Zelda, which I played not too long ago, which I feel still holds up extremely well, and is still one of the best um, games ever made, in my opinion, I think that Metroid uh, kind of isn't. It's sort of a stepping stone into into some better iterations of itself. Mm-hmm. Even though I do think that, that Super Metroid lost some of those survival horror elements, and some of that open world exploration because it gives you a map. Mm. I do feel like that was kind of a step back. On the other hand, the controls are much better. The environments are much more um, lush and detailed mm. and not as repetitive, a lot more creative. Uh, also, the boss patterns in, <laughs> in the original are just really, really repetitive, mm. really just obnoxious. Um, I wouldn't really even say that they're hard, just obnoxious. You have to keep doing the same <laughs> thing over and over again. There's not a whole lot of room for it. Um, thinking on your feet or tactics, you just kind of have to memorize a pattern. I know yeah. that was something that a lot of games, especially arcade games, mm. excelled at. No, but, Pac-Man um, was all about the patterns. As a matter of oh, fact, yeah. when I was a kid, Pac-Man one was. of the one of my favorite types of magazine were the video game magazines because back then yeah. they were all about the patterns. So mm-hmm. you would get the pattern for every level mm-hmm. for X number of games in each of those, and that was well worth the you know the mm-hmm. dollar or two you spent on the magazine because mm-hmm. it saved you so many quarters. Well. Yeah, yeah. That was the thing why that, that's why uh, Ms. Pac Man is the better game than Pac Man because Ms. Pac Man added that little random element to the ghosts, so you couldn't just follow a pattern. 
Well, you remember that, right? They added a little bit of randomness to the way the ghosts move. Sometimes they wouldn't use the same pattern they were supposed to use. They would sometimes go one way instead of the other, and that was the big difference between the two, and it made it so that you couldn't just memorize a pattern. It made it a lot more challenging. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yep. I just I just played Miss mm-hmm. Pac Man and had a lot of fun. So. Oh, it's fun. <laughs> anyway, I say this as someone that I, I actually was obsessed with that game for a while and like played it all the way through over and over again. So anyway. Baby Pac Man, um, <laughs> not so much. Oh my god, well, it's hard. Regardless, Pac Man um, Junior. That's what yeah. it was called with the yep. pinball and they, they had it was half pinball machine, mm-hmm. half arcade game. It was oh. really bizarre. This is the gaming meta news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. Last week we talked about, we had some reckless speculation um, about the uh, Konami-Kojima breakup. And for those of us, the, for those that may not have heard, uh, I don't know how you might be living under a rock, um, essentially um, Hideo Kojima, who is uh, the creator of the Metal Gear Solid franchise, among other games, um, it has sort of had this falling out with uh, Konami, and it's been a lot of speculation. His name has been taken off of Metal Gear uh, Solid Five cover art. We're not exactly sure what his position is in the company anymore, the current Current talk is that he's no longer employed by them officially, but he is still under contract to finish Metal Gear Solid Five. Mm-hmm. So he's there as a contractor, not as a full-time employee. Um, the reason behind this, we're still a little bit unsure on, and we spe- we did some record speculation about it last week. And now I can report back uh, that we do have a source that has given shed some light on this. Um, I'd like to hear y'all's thoughts about it. So essentially, um, Rika Muranaka, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, she is a composer for uh, the Metal Gear Solid franchise. Uh, the music, specifically, she did a lot of the um, songs with vocals, did a lot of the arrangements for the songs. And uh, she went on a po- the, um, the, Kodak, the Kodak podcast um, and was interviewed by Clayton Daly. And essentially, she said that um, the reason why she lost her job um, for... She was not brought in to do music for uh, the new Metal Gear Solid was because they could not afford her. Konami's really been trying to cut back on costs. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the falling out with Kojima was that he was trying to make essentially the best game that he could with Metal Gear Solid Five. He uh-huh. wanted it to be kind of the magnum opus of yeah, the series yeah, yeah. and ma- wanted it to be his absolute... And, you know, for those that know Kojima, he's always been a perfectionist. And yeah. he's willing to put in, you know, work... Work the extra time, bring in the bring in the people needed, and, and put in as much effort as he can to make. He's like a Japanese gym. Yeah, he, he goes, <laughs> thank you, thank you. but he goes well above and beyond to try to get the best product out there. Mm-hmm. And Konami is all about they're trying to cut cost, and they're worried about the budget, and they were they getting really annoyed that he basically would just keep ignoring their calls for we gotta you know cut back on the budget. He would do things like, for example, Marnaka said that he would. Um, order songs from her in some of the earlier Metal Gear Solid games and he would just keep ordering songs from her until, he, until she made a song that he liked. He'd be mm. like, yeah, this is pretty good. Make another one. Oh. And he would just keep having her make more stuff and she's getting paid for all these. It's not like she's only getting paid for right. the one to take. Right, right. So he would do things like this because he knows what he likes and I've said it before, I think the Metal Gear Solid series has some of the best music in all of gaming so I think he knows music. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. But... I'm assuming it's it's not as simple as he just said. Eh, I don't like it. Go no, do something of course, different. of course not. He's actually he's actually very, he's known as being pretty hands on, as hands on as well. Okay. So no, it's it's it it was not as flippant as that. So um, essentially, he was he was let go because of the this mo- these money problems that he mm-hmm. has with the uh, with Konami, and that kind of brings us into a larger discussion that I would like to talk a little bit on, um, time permitting. Mm-hmm. Uh, this idea of. Uh, creativity and trying to make, uh, you know, pour all of your creativity and your heart into making a great game versus the business end of it. You know, mm-hmm. how much money do you have to spend? Can you stay within budget? Uh, where do you all fall along this line? Yeah, so it, it's a tricky thing. And I think we've talked a little bit about this before. If not on the podcast, I've definitely been in conversations about this just in general. Um, and in a way, it kind of relates to the sort of like indie versus AAA discussion, where in AAA they have timetables and they've got big budgets, but still budgets, you know, um, where they're given this much money and this much time to make a thing. And that usually means you have to make some deceits in the design and the and, and, and implementation in order to make that work. Whereas with indie stuff, um, you tend to be able to have more creative freedom, smaller teams also. You can have like a more sort of like coherent vision and not mm-hmm. have to necessarily like have one person's sort of vision like playing the telephone game with all the people under them in a sense you know um so but you like, have much a much bigger budget yeah triple a games yeah. that's the other thing they're, 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 they're pros and cons they have to definitely yeah. make a lot of cons- mm-hmm. you know they gotta make some conceits too because yeah. they they don't have the budget yeah yeah no there's i'm not saying that, like indie games are like superior anyway because they're smaller and they yeah. don't have those sort of corporate constraints um but definitely more focused creative vision because yeah. when you have less people working on it you mm-hmm. can you can you know there's less people that can possibly dilute your vision as you yeah. so I agree with but that point. as an artist yeah okay I will tell you this right now even an artist 
has to know when enough is enough, when it's time to stop, when it's time to get the project out the door. Because believe me, yeah. artists will work on something till doomsday. Yeah. All right. <laughs> to make sure it's yeah, perfect. It's true. Because in our eyes, it's never perfect. I think it's uh, never done. Yeah. I, I think George Lucas said that um, you know a movie is never finished; it's just released. I think the same kind of goes for games. You yes. know? Yeah, well, he's wrong, yeah. see? That, that <laughs> I disagree with entirely. And You're I, messing with yeah. other people's. And once you've released it, it's become part of the Zeke guy, so to speak. Mm. You have other people putting their own stamp on it in their minds mm. and going back and making Han Solo. So you're, you're, you're first. talking about his revision stuff. I'm, yes, I'm just talking about like yeah. when I, releasing a film, like when they released. I think because he said that in the context of like episode two or three or something, um, in like kind of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, he was saying, like, you know, we just had to, like, we were constantly working on it and, like, you know, fixing things and updating things, but eventually it just has to go out. Oh, yeah, eventually it's Yeah, I don't, out. yeah, yeah I, I agree. I think the sentiment is good. I, I agree with, when you apply it to all of his revisions, that's when it breaks down. But I think in terms of the idea of you're always working on it and at a certain point it has to go out, mm-hmm. um, that's something that, that eventually everyone has to face. I know I know Kojima is has been known as a perfectionist, mm-hmm. and I think that's one of the reasons why his, his games tend to have a higher quality, but I do think that... Uh, when you're talking about um, this this problem of running into the release wall and the, the release date and the, mm-hmm. the, the, the schedule, it especially in a, in AAA titles today, that's caused a lot of games to be released that are simply not finished. Mm-hmm. And this is something that ha- that we talked about that I remember talking about quite a bit with mm-hmm. Arkham Knight, yeah. uh, Batman Arkham Knight. I yeah. didn't say it; I said the B word um, <laughs> when I went kind of off on 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 Warner Brothers Interactive for pushing that game out when it was simply not ready, mm-hmm. uh, particularly with the PC version. But there were a lot of other updates for the console versions as well. Like, not we were talking about this this morning. Fix it in post. Yeah. yeah. And, and in the case of, you know, it was always, during film school, it was always fix it in post. You know, you screwed up here, well, fix it in post. Now we've got CG, everything's fixed in post. And now we've got video games, it's everything's fixed after yeah. release. And uh, so. as someone who works primarily in post-production, it's like, there are a lot of things we can fix in post, but there's some things that you can't. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. you got to get it right the first time, yeah, or right. else it doesn't, it right. doesn't work. And, mm-hmm. and that, that fixing it after release is something that I think is, is a big problem with the, with the modern industry and is, is causing a lot of, of people to become disillusioned with the modern AAA gaming industry. Mm-hmm. So I do think that when it comes to when it comes to that, there is something to be said for pushing back the release date to, to release a game that's right, that's mm-hmm. good. And that's I know that's something that Nintendo mm-hmm. is willing to do, and Konami's not, because Konami, as, as we know, we've talked about it as well, is trying to move away from the console space anyway. Yeah. Which trying to go like, mobile, to it, trying to it, basically it, kill this it, company it, while I, such a great... While I get that, I understand it. It's yeah. like, if there's one game you spare no expense on, it's Metal Gear Solid, yeah. you know? And so like and it's can, also a guaranteed moneymaker, too. Yeah, all like, those games sell very well. It's only a guaranteed moneymaker if it actually gets released and sold. Mm-hmm. That's See, also that's true. Thing. I'm actually reminded, that's because uh, when Metal Gear Solid 4 came out, I got the um, special edition that mm. came with a Blu-ray with a bunch of featurettes and stuff, including a, uh, I think it was like an hour, hour and a half sort of documentary film about the making of the game. You watched all um, that, didn't you? I did, yeah. You were such a game. It was actually super awesome. <laughs> yeah. I think, actually, this is when I was like, still in like late high school, early college. And so it was like kind of one of my first introductions to like the behind the scenes of game making. So it was actually really fascinating in that regard. Um, but they had a similar sort of problem where, you know, budget plays into it, but it was mainly time where they were trying to um, add things and change things and refine things. But every time they would do that, more bugs would pop up. And so there was kind of like this little bit of a uh, tension between um, Kojima and another one of his uh, teammates, uh, one of like the higher ups mm-hmm. um, in programming, where it's like, if you want these bugs to get fixed, we can't keep changing things, you know. <laughs> and but it's like, well, you know, we we need to make sure that we like change everything, make sure everything's right. And so, you know, you got a code freeze at some point, yeah. And feature creep, and that's mm-hmm. that's probably one of the biggest problems with games nowadays. They try to cram too much stuff in there. Mm-hmm. They lose the core of what the game actually is, mm-hmm. and then you know, yeah, I, yeah. I would agree with that statement because I do think that a lot of games nowadays have become so they feel like they want to be ev- something for everyone mm-hmm. and they end up being something f- like nothing for everyone essentially i mean it's just like there's too much going on there's they want to they want like i understand that there's a lot of open world there's a focus on open world and sandbox and that kind of thing in modern game because we can do that from a processing standpoint the problem is that it's actually very hard to do those sort of games it's very hard like I can go on and on about Grand Theft Auto and how successful they are at that, but very few people can do it right. Mm-hmm. And when you have series like, for example, Assassin's Creed that is constantly trying to do that kind of stuff and failing every single time, just miserably, it just feels like an unfocused mess every time I try to play those. Um, bar- barring the first couple, I mm-hmm. think. The second one it was 
all right, was pretty good. First one was uh, kind of a stepping stone. The first one was a pro. And then everyone after two, in my opinion, is absolute dog shit. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and say I really think that they're crappy games. Mm. And I think I'm that's enjoying one of the four reasons. so far, but I'm reserving judgment on it. Well, in whole until I finish it. Yeah, I mean that's that's fine. I'm not I'm future button mosh. I yeah, and I do understand <laughs> that there's things about them that that can be can be interesting and, mm. and can be enjoyable. I'm not saying that like you're playing it, and you're like, oh, this is terrible the whole way mm. through. I just mean that overall as an experience. It, it doesn't have that focus that you that, that you want mm-hmm. when you're playing. It. Well, this is where and and again, I say I'm an artist. I do I, I, I design games. I do UIs. I I make game to, uh, you know systems design. Do all sorts of stuff like that. But even I know that if you let an artist go, they will try to make everything work just so. They will try to put every feature under the sun in there to make it the greatest game. Pop Peter Molyneux is probably the <laughs> the, the biggest right. culprit in this. And, and I love Peter Molyneux. And I think but, and, and certain certain <clears throat> designers are better at that. And I do think that there are some people that are almost the the auteurs of the gaming world. Mm-hmm. Kind of like to, to borrow a film term. Yeah. yeah. And Peter Molyneux being the I would say I would say rebel. probably not because he's made a lot of crap. I'm talking about actual auteurs. I'm talking about people like uh, like Kojima mm-hmm. or or like Miyamoto. Mm-hmm. And guys, there's there's a few of them that are those sort of people that can kind of put out, they can sort of put their personal stamp mm-hmm. on a game. Sid Meier would be a good Sid Meier, yeah. I agree. I would agree. I'm sorry, I, you may not like his games, but Peter Molyneux at one point could do anything he wanted. Mm-hmm. And that's how he got to make those crap games mm-hmm. because like George Lucas, <laughs> he got way too much power yeah. and way too much control that's and, true. And, and and kept slipping release days, kept adding things yeah. in and was not contained. I'm, I'm he little, didn't have a, a, yeah. a Lawrence Kasdan I'm, or somebody like that. Yeah, I'm a little hard on him just because I think that he's one of those where and I, and I would agree he does kind of fit in that in that mold. He does have his own his own personal like persona, and, and you can feel that in his games. I agree. Um, I just think that he's one of those where you you don't give him those restrictions, and suddenly he's churning out garbage. And if you do that with, for example, like Kojima, maybe it, the game will come out, but it's still going to be great when it does eventually. Same thing with Miyamoto. Like you know, he, these are people that don't like. You, the more the more you give them, the more funding you give them, the more team you give them, just the better product is going to is going to be. Let's look at it from another perspective too, not just from the perspective of the corporation that has to make a buck and the artist who has this grand sweeping vision, but the the biggest thing I've noticed recently is the fans mm. drive this problem more than anything else. They want X, Y, and Z. <laughs> they get excited about X, Y, and Z, and they want it now rather than later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of pressure mm-hmm. on 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 game company X to make the biggest, greatest ultimate. I mean, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of business pressure there. And when they do, when when a, when a gaming company does slip a release date. There's a, usually a pretty big outcry from the gaming community. Oh yeah, and it, I think it's ridiculous too mm. because when I hear, you know, and Nintendo does this all the time, and so that's one of the one of the people that you know I talk about sleeping release dates because they won't release a game unless they feel it's ready. Mm. Blizzard's the same way, and Blizzard's the yeah. same way, and people will come down on them. Valve, yeah, <laughs> Valve, uh, Half Life Three confirmed. I don't. <laughs> I, don't I, I waited ten years for Team Fortress Two, yeah. and what came out was not what they promised. Me. Okay, Fair well, that's a, I think that's a little different because with Valve, it was more like they have these concepts in mind to like they didn't necessarily confirm it and say it's definitely coming and the same thing with half-life 3 they never have actually said yeah no they haven't never. it's it's just one of those things where it's been talked about and it's like we want to do half-life 3 as opposed to say with nintendo every every legend of zelda game has been to slip their release date it's always like oh yeah and they, they'll show they'll show a video of it they'll show something they'll say it's going to come on this date and then it always slips the release and date. that's where the fans step in and, I, and, and they and build up this image in their head yeah. of what's coming out that can never ever meet what yeah. is coming out it's just it's just well, impossible sometimes it does. <laughs> we're talking about legend of zelda series here but um <laughs> i agree with we you. know you love legend know. of zelda and I, uh, he's wearing the shirt yeah. and the hat right now he's got pointy elf ears on right yeah now. Oh, i do i'm wearing i'm wearing my pointy elf ears. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have my, my elven booties. That's from uh, you know that's from the uh, Legend of Zelda '90s television series. Go back and watch. It's got the booties. Um, <laughs> oh, excuse me. No, yeah. Excuse me, <laughs> princess. No. Uh, it's a it's it's a three prong problem. It's the artist you know wanting to spend too much time, the corporations needing to to make money and get the thing out, and then yeah. the fans basically ginning up the whole mess. I mean, getting it just riled up to a point where they can never be happy. Right. Well, it's the like yeah, the marketing people. I mean, the, there's pressure from the marketing people and, and sales to get the product out because, which is, they're putting the pressure on the business people as well because they hear all this fan out. And we so were very agree. familiar with that, yes, you and me. Yes. yes, definitely. Um, so yes, oh, that, the reality is actually creating things. Yeah, that is, that, <laughs> that is an unfortunate truth. Now it's time for let's watch, let's plays. The 
part of our show about games, about shows about games. Recently, uh, you know, sort of in light of us, um, you know, we talked a lot about Titan's Grave, and so I've been curious to see a few of these uh, um, other Let's Plays that do tabletop RPGs, and a lot of times I'm not a huge fan of them because it tends to be in, like, three-plus-hour streams, um, which unless I'm just kind of, like, working on something, letting it running in the background, and at that point not paying much attention, I don't have time to sit down for three hours every day to watch an episode of a role-playing game. Um, that being said, uh, I follow Adam Koble on Twitter, who is one of the designers of Dungeon World, uh, the tabletop role-playing system um and he is doing um a campaign with uh the burning wheel which was one of the first systems that i really fell in love with because i only recently got um introduced to tabletop rpgs um and he actually has a presentation could, sorry go ahead. excuse me i was gonna say could you just for people that don't know what burning wheel is could you just give like a mm-hmm. quick one sentence synopsis of most right. complex RPG <laughs> ever. I know, I know saying that is kind of a bit intimidating yeah. maybe, but if you, so, two uh, sentences. W- so one, way, two. one way that I'll sort of sum it up just in general is if you think of D&D as kind of the quintessential tabletop RPG, um, D&D is about kicking down doors, killing monsters, taking loot ultimately. Burning Wheel is about the characters and character change and having your beliefs drive your action throughout mm-hmm. the story. Um, and it is fairly complicated. It's definitely not a sort of be- beginner's game. I was only able to play it because I had a group that all knew what they were doing and I was kind of able to learn the ropes as I went. Um, but one of the things that I really liked about when I first heard about it was that you... Um, you actually build your character using what's called life paths, where you basically go from birth to present day and talk about what they did throughout their life and how that informed um, what they are now. But basically, Adam Koble, um, who did not design the system, it was designed by Luke Crane, um, really likes the system and draws a lot of inspiration from in the work that he does. Um, and he, uh, to prepare for the um, stream that he's currently doing, I believe it's uh, Roll D20 Presents on Twitch. Um, they play it live. You can also go back and watch the episodes afterward. Um, he basically did a presentation with the slideshow where he talked about what is the burning wheel um, and gives a really cool, like for design geeks like me, you know, really cool analysis of how the game's mechanics work and how they reinforce what the game is wanting you to do, which is to let your character's beliefs drive your action and have that change your character as you go along. So hmm. I definitely recommend checking it out. It's a really um, fascinating listen. So. Is it kind of, I mean, at what point does it evolve from being some guy telling you about his, you know, 18th level paladin or whatever, and you sort <laughs> oh. of going <laughs> in the corner? No, so. it's, it's actually it's a 19th level paladin. Um, that's okay. the difference. From, from the get-go, actually, it does a really good job of talking about what the system is and how it works. And kind of like, it, it's the sort of stuff that you can pick up um, by getting the book and um, sort of reading through the first couple of chapters, um, except with a little bit more commentary to help clarify things. So essentially, he's introducing it to people who haven't heard the system or are probably familiar with role-playing games, explaining what it is about the burning wheel that makes it different from the typical RPG. No, it's, yeah, it's pretty much a psychological game as opposed to a physical game. We yeah. do physical things, but it's all about the psychology oh, of the definitely, character. Definitely, yeah. yeah. It's not about how, if you can bend bars, lift gates. It's about, <laughs> you know, how do you feel about the bars? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you bending the bars? Why are you bending the bars? Yeah. What in your past made you bend the bars? <laughs> yeah. My so. mother never loved me. So I'm going to bend so the I bars. Binge bars <laughs> my bad hats. Incidentally, life path systems uh, originated in the 70s with mm-hmm. Traveler. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the one of the one of the great all time science fiction RPGs huh. where you mm-hmm. can actually die during character creation. Oh, no, yeah, uh, yeah. Beautiful game. I've actually <laughs> wanted to play Traveler because I, I was reading about it when I was doing research of it, and I was I always found. I mean, it, it seems like one of those games that I'm sure is very dated. But some of the concepts of it just seemed really cool. Like I'd, I'd love to just kind of like play like a really short campaign just to kind of get my feet wet and kind of mm. understand what the system sounds is about. like. A future roll, what, I mean, what roll, roll with it, roll with it, potentially. Like Maybe, yeah. I actually have the little black books. Well, that's actually a pretty nice segue into our meaty discussion for the day. So, Jim, do you want to introduce them? Sure. Um, our um, topic for today and why we brought in Nathaniel, uh, we're going to talk about the analog to digital transition, uh, which is something that he's um, intimately aware. And uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some hybrid games that possibly bridge the gap between um, the analog and digital space. Uh, now, are, also, we, are we talking um, analog games in general or role-playing games specifically? Or both? Both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, one of my... And, and the reason I uh, introduced myself as coming from UTD mm-hmm. is because my master's degree, I spent a lot of time uh, trying to figure out where that divide was and how those two things cross over. Mm-hmm. Because, quite frankly, there are very different... 
mind spaces for analog games and digital games. Mm -hmm. Very, very different. And uh, each of them has their own strengths and weaknesses. One's not better than the other. They're just different experiences. Right. But considering the power of uh, a mobile technology in particular, why aren't we melding those two? Why don't we have digital RPGs, not like a you know Neverwinter Nights, mm -hmm. but an actual tabletop RPG that is played entirely in a digital realm at a tabletop, not mm -hmm. online right. uh, over the internet? Because mm -hmm. uh, that's been going on for you know ten years or more at this point. And kind of combining the flexibility and narrative openness of tabletop role playing games with the computing ability of a computer a right. mobile device. Gary Gygax, back in 1979, it was 78 or 79 in Dragon Magazine, he actually predicted the coming of the computer RPG. Mm -hmm. And he talked about it, not in the sense of like World of Warcraft or anything like that, but he talked about it in the sense of uh, one day we won't have to consult charts and tables mm -hmm. and stuff like that because a computer will do all that work for us at the table while we're... He predicted this, mm -hmm. I mean, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. which is pretty, you know, far, you know, far sighted if you think yeah. about it. Yeah, no, and it, I mean... There's there's games that have that are a direct adaptation of the Dungeons and Dragons rule uh, rule book rule sets that you know for example that that are in a digital space like Baldur's Gate the Baldur's yeah. Gate series or the Icewind Dale you know that that line of, of games which I I still think are excellent some of the best computer RPGs that have been made particularly Baldur's Gate two Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate two no I love those but I will say this flat out. All of you out there listening, you would not have World of Warcraft. You would not have any of the games that you enjoy nowadays if it weren't for D and D. D and D introduced that concept of the character mm -hmm. and the individual as a hero, and so on and so forth, and and, and a whole lot of other forms mm -hmm. that we still apply today. I mean, how many games have hit points? For goodness' sake, yeah. And this um, is, of course, an idea that was evolved from the opposite, which was war gaming, yes. um, which is about commanding armies and like the individual not really mattering so much as the bigger picture, right? And you know that is right. actually. Actually, a very good point because mm -hmm. the divide between the analog and the digital today mm -hmm. is the same as the divide between the war gamer and the role player, or even the fantasy war gamer. Because fantasy war games are considered to be trivial and childish mm -hmm. uh, to true war gamers. You yeah, know? You, know, you know the grognards of the day, <laughs> you know, wouldn't have any of that old nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> you know, get that away from my table. I'm Napoleon. Yeah, but, you know, I'm a fake Napoleon, but <laughs> get your fake elf away. From me. Uh, so, it, in in much the same way, I have found that. The adoption of digital devices to take that workload on, like he predicted, has been slow, it has been hesitant, mm -hmm. and it is only now coming to... I mean, when we were at school, I was constantly pushing, we need a mobile lab to explore this, and they're like, nah, nah, nah. you know, video games, video games, video games, yeah. video games, video games, video games. Mm -hmm. Theaters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I was like, no, there's there's a market for people, especially nowadays. Board games are exploding in popularity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The the sales are going up every single year because people want to be face to face with other people and interact with other people, which is something tabletop mm -hmm. games, analog games give mm -hmm. that video games don't necessarily do. I mean, you can sit around, you can play Mario with your friends and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But well, and those and those are less common now. That the couch multiplayer is less common than it used to be because yeah. because we have all these uh, the online availability to play that. online because yeah. it's so everyone's connected online now. And it's so, a different experience. Yeah, Super Smash is. Brothers is nothing like the basic tabletop well, game. And, it's chaotic, it's fast paced, it's in your but, face, it's but it's, not, but it's not just that. You know, the other big difference. Whenever we're whenever we're playing, for example, any sort of any sort of RPG, any sort of tabletop game, we're sitting around a table looking at each other. Yeah. When we're playing when you're sitting there playing, say, Smash Bros. or Mario Kart, what are you doing? You're sitting looking there at, and you're looking at a screen. Right. You're right. not look, you're not looking so even though you're playing against other people, sure. It's it's less like you're playing against them and like you're playing against their character in the game. Mm. Yeah. So it's 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 not quite as um, it doesn't really feel quite as social. Well, let me take that and go into uh, some research I did and talk about the differences between table uh, analog and digital. Mm -hmm. Okay. First of all, and the, and the biggest one is they inhabit a different part of your brain mm -hmm. when you're experiencing them. Okay. Video games are very much a visual medium okay mm -hmm. and you take in most of the information through your visual cortex and it gets stored in a different part of the brain tabletop role-playing games and a lot of board games are a more of an acoustic medium and I know that sounds obvious, the eyes, ears, <laughs> but it stores a different part of the brain, stores a different type of memory. I have a friend in uh, France named Sarah Newton. Uh, she wrote Might Magic. She's a, she's a big game designer. Uh, and Did you say she wrote Might Magic? 
No, it's it's a it's actually a, an role playing game. So oh, okay. Not not the actual video. Game. I was but, like, I was like, hold on a second, I want to know more. <laughs> uh, but uh, and it's along that narrative mm. route that uh, Crane and, mm. and folks are taking. But anyways, the uh, she had a, a word for it, exo memories, and I think it's a perfect example or a perfect word to describe what I'm talking about. Nobody ever remembers being Mario. They remember playing Mario. They don't remember being Mario, being a pulky little plumber with the ranch who beats Bowser, right? Mm -hmm. But I remember, to this day, the very first character I played in Mm D&D way back 40 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, not quite. You played it when you were two? (laughs) No, not when I was But but way back back in the day. Hardcore. It was like (laughs) early 80s at some point. uh, It was the the mold they set, and we were mixing Mm -hmm. 80s. D&D and Mulberry. But I remember that first Hobbit thief, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I remember him like it was my own self. Mm-hmm. He's a character that is me in a second life. And I don't think of him as a character on a screen. I think of him as me, mm. right? Yeah. And that's one of the huge differences between uh, visual games and acoustic. But games. do you think that's because of, of the, the medium or do you, like you know, the visual versus acoustic? Or do you think it's because... Of all the freedom, the significantly more freedom that you have. That is part of it. Yes, I'm, I'm giving you the the differences. All right. Okay, uh, the other difference between analog and game and, and digital games is digital games have to be programmed. They have to be built. There's only so much content, as we right. talked about just previously. You can only go so far. You got to release the damn thing eventually, mm-hmm. right? So with role playing games, there is no restriction. You're not waiting for uh, you know extra stuff to come down the pike or a second version of the game or whatever. It's all there. If you bought the first three books for D and D, you could play the rest of your life. It didn't. It didn't really matter as long as your imagination held up. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what happens. As long as the GM keeps inventing more towns for you to burn down. <laughs> In the case playing. of some of my players, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, new town. Let's burn it down. <laughs> okay, yes. Totally derail the adventure. Thank you very much. That was the other option, yes. And and you're you're, you're not going to get a whole lot of that in video games because you kind of get railroaded <laughs> quite a bit in most games. Even the open open uh, games have you know things that you need to do in order to accomplish the right. mission. Right? Mm-hmm. They have those... Um, uh, the bottleneck moments where you have to complete a cer- something something specific to hit that next story point so you can continue in the next area of the game. Exactly. So uh, that's one of the other differences. The other difference. Uh, uh, the other difference is the, uh, the 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 equipment you need is is very different. Okay, especially with tabletop role playing games. Mm-hmm. Right. No electricity. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Right, it's all right there, and you can take it with you. You can go places, but and this is where the digital and the uh, and the, and, the, and the hybrid need to meet. You can actually uh, take a digital system. Put all the information you need on it and run from a tablet, right? Mm-hmm. We've done that before, right? When I run Doctor Who with you guys, I don't really use the books. Mm-hmm. I use my, my laptop, right? right? So mm-hmm. we've got ebooks. We can actually search the rules using mm-hmm. bookmarks and stuff like that, right? Uh, which actually is kind of sad for me. I'm a, I'm, I'm a bookophile, right? Mm-hmm. I, or a bibliophile. Yes. Yeah, I, I love yeah. the smell of books. I mm-hmm. really do. But it is really much more convenient to carry that around mm-hmm. than carry around well, all the books. We're going to get some my RPGs are actually just in digital format because I, yeah. I look and try out so many different types actually i study more than i actually play yeah no. um but i i buy the five to ten dollar pdf rather than buying the 30 to 40 dollar book we, so. we still have not had smell vision or at least it's equivalent <laughs> i had smell vision in the 80s you bought you bought stickers I, I, from and i remember those two little scratch and sniff things which are <laughs> yeah. terrible but no but we need to have that for uh for ipads just kind of like you know has this little puff of like like aroma that comes out like smells like a book whenever you're reading your ebook you just kind of get some aroma <laughs> but without it'll, it'll probably cause cancer but yeah without sidetracking too much i've always wondered if there's some way kind of in the same way we can create any color with rgb three types of light if we can create like any type of smell with like three or four or five or maybe even ten substances because ultimately everything in the universe comes from the same elements right okay you're so, opening a whole <laughs> yeah, just, like, with that i can't, we'll believe, just, I can't but, believe you just said without trying to go off topic yeah, yeah. i mean that's <laughs> But that, just, just consider that. Supremely that. off topic. <laughs> all you uh, physicists out there, get on that. So <laughs> let's, let's, meanwhile, let's put a pin in this and have a, an all physics episode. Yeah, or uh, yeah. would that be chemistry? But chemistry. Be chemistry is applied physics, though. So there you go. There you go. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Yeah, but that's all applied math. We're getting, so, yeah. we're getting way out of this. <laughs> okay. Anyway, math, math is the purest thing. Right? The problem with the digital uh, book and everything else solution is the fact that. Well, one, you're still carrying around all the miniatures and the maps and and all that other kind of stuff, when really all this stuff can be contained in a digital program, and it could do all the rules stuff for you. So why are you reading a book on a tablet when the tablet can be handling all the rules for you? We've had a lot of half 
attempts at doing this. Like, mm -hmm. for instance, the Dungeon Crawl Classics has a great thing uh, from Purple Sorcerer. It's called mm -hmm. the the uh, the uh, the Crawler. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It is the crawler, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because I have that on my phone. Yeah, I have it on my phone because yeah. I love DCC. Mm -hmm. It's just it's classic. But anyways, the, uh, it, yeah, the it it has a lot of automated stuff on there, but it's mainly just rolling dice, yeah. uh, keeping you, you, track of spells. You still have to know all the rules and basically just say um, rather than rolling the dice physically, I'm tapping these things or pulling up the table this way exactly. as opposed to going through the book. It's got yeah. some reference stuff. It's got some good. It's got some reference stuff in there. Stuff too, in there. So. Mm. But it's not automated. It's you going and looking and right. reading, right? right? And that's where I think we need to move on. Mm -hmm. We need to get on past that. So, uh, as as part of a research project and also as a Kickstarter, I tried to create the first all digital RPG. I've been talking about it mm -hmm. for three years at that point, mm -hmm. and no, nobody was doing it. So, mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to make an RPG where you not only controlled every th aspect of the character from your tablet, but the GM also controlled every aspect of the game from his tablet, mm -hmm. and everything was automated. So, if you're going to do this type of role, it reads your character sheet gives you a result right mm -hmm. uh, if you're the game master and you uh, do some damage with a, a monster or something they don't go and pop their little bubbles or mm -hmm. take away their life or whatever you fling it at them and, mm -hmm. and it pops up on their character right. you got a secret message you want to give them you can take that and fling it over to another guy mm -hmm. right yeah, yeah. Uh, and all the rules were automated so it was it was there was no referencing there was a rule book mm -hmm. but the rule book was really just there if you wanted something to read and you wanted to see Jeff Lobenstein's pictures right <laughs> So that was the first attempt at doing that, and I got so much pushback. Mm. I had all these older role players, for instance, telling me that they didn't want those newfangled tablets and phones at their table. They're already enough of a distraction, mm. and we like pens and paper and dice. I had young people telling me, mm. well, I like pens and paper and dice. This is never going to sell, blah, mm. blah, 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 right? And the Kickstarter only made it halfway. Mm. So and do you, have a, do you have a theory about why they, they felt that way? Um. I think there are a lot of people who kind of see tabletop role playing as the nobler alternative to video games. That is exactly yeah. what, what it is. So, oh, so they're they're kind of purists because that's how it's always been done and we like that about it because it's, it's the Wargamer D and D divide all over again, but now it's analog versus digital. Mm -hmm. You know, I play tabletop games because I want to play a tabletop game, not a dang video game. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's what it is. And this is not strictly, and, and I will admit, uh, mine was a very niche thing. I mean, Battletech crossed with heavy metal, yeah. you know, is, you know, kind of a niche thing. Mm -hmm. you, you really have to appreciate the 80s to really mm -hmm. want to play that game. But there have been two other role playing game projects that came up after that that tried to do the same thing. Both of them made it about halfway. Both of them failed. Mm. So there's an actual resistance in the marketplace to this sort of thing, which boggles my mind. Mm. So I was trying to think of ways to improve that, right? Mm. First of all, I didn't go far enough. What I did was a tabletop role-playing game in tablet form, but thinking back to what is a tabletop role-playing game, where is that space we're playing in? Mm -hmm. Where is it we're trying to, to trigger the imagination? Mm. You know what? All those character sheets and all that other kind of stuff? Why do you need them if you're taking advantage of the digital space's ability to provide you with a more, uh, I guess, uh, uh, more verisimilitude in your interface, right? Mm -hmm. right? So, for instance, if I were going to do a game now, and I, I, if I can ever get a programmer to help me with this, but getting programmers to invest their time in this is really hard because they don't believe in it either because mm -hmm. they want to do real games, real video games. It's the same on the other side. They're like, I want to do a real video game. Yeah. I don't want to do this, um, you know... <laughs> tabletop crap. Bridging worlds is difficult. Yeah, bridging worlds is really difficult. But if I were to do it now, there would be no character sheet. Mm. So, for instance, uh, Void Hunters, which yeah. is a science fiction game I want to do, it would be the view from your HUD. Mm. We would assume that everybody either had an iPhone, like from Futurama, <laughs> <laughs> or some kind of uh, goggles or something, and you would see your health represented by your heartbeat mm. or stress levels represented by uh, you know brain patterns or whatever, mm. and you could really get away from the character sheet and the numbers and do it that way now we're really that, talking yeah, about yeah I think that's a really good way to go with it too because I think that's one of the big advantages that the digital can have it can do all that stuff behind the scenes exactly and you never have to see it and not only do you never have to see it you really shouldn't see it. Exactly. And the Game Master would be the same way. Mm -hmm. No book to read. There would be no rule book. Mm -hmm. It's basically the Game Master says, I want to do this, mm -hmm. and, he, and he hits a button, and it does all of it, does all the tabulation, yeah, yeah. figures all that crap out on its own. you got to go that one step further if it's going to yeah. work. Yeah, and I think the other, the other thing, I, that would make it 
different enough where you're not really trying to get, per se, the people that want to play the analog game or want to play the digital game. You're going for people that want to play this style of game, which is kind of different in its own way. Its yeah, own exactly. Way. So then you can either get, well, essentially like a new audience. No, I'm not. I'm not going to say there's not overlap because there will be a lot, like mostly overlap between these two different um, demographics. But they're into it not because they're looking for a new or a different take on an analog game or a different take on a digital game. But this, they're looking for something that is just a different experience. Exactly. And I want to say, I want to preface or not preface. I want uh, to to say that. Uh, just because it doesn't work for tabletop RPGs doesn't mean it isn't creeping into other areas. Okay, tabletop board games are being translated into mobile apps all the time. Okay, I have Talisman on mine, which mm-hmm. I, I play the crap out of Talisman. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a stupid, simple game, but you know it's great when you're sitting on the train and you you've got nothing yeah. better to do than play a game of Talisman, right? Yeah. And then uh, there's, I mean, Hearthstone is essentially it is a a card game that mm-hmm. is designed to be played you know fully digitally. Right. Exactly. So. But even beyond that. There are two other games that have come about in the last few years, uh, uh, Gollum Arcana mm-hmm. and XCOM, mm-hmm. which are truly really yeah. taking the advantage of the of the mobile platform. Yeah. Because XCOM, your your enemy is really doing stuff mm-hmm. that you don't know about because yeah. you can't see it because it's all being computed, right? right, right. Uh, Gollum Arcana, you can have true fog of war because using that that uh, that digital pen, mm-hmm. you can make sure that this square is trapped or this square has treasure. So and and nobody. Nobody sees that. Mm-hmm. Nobody has to be a referee. One of the big things about the early war games was there was always a referee mm-hmm. who made snap decisions, so the mm-hmm. games were a little more flexible. Mm-hmm. Uh, now you don't even need that because you can have that stuff pre-programmed in there, and you can uh, you can include that in your board game using your your digital pen or your mobile phone or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it also makes cooperative games much more fun. So you know, if you're playing XCOM, it's much more fun being cooperative when you know that there's an actual AI yeah. behind the enemy. Right. As opposed to something like Lord of the Rings, which is basically who's going to make the crappy draw out of the bag yeah. this time, which is just, you know, it's totally random. Absolutely mm-hmm. random. And and, the, and see, the cool way to, to get, getting back to the, the um, tabletop RPG space, mm-hmm. um, that's one of the things that, that I know some people do enjoy GMing, but there's a lot of people that would prefer to be a player if they could, even the GM. And if you can take that out of the GM, like if you can take the need for a GM out of their hand so that everyone can be, can play and it can be a cooperative game with, with a digit, like a digital AI GM. That would kind of be the ultimate I'm experience. Kind of, I'm yeah. interested to see like kind of, I mean, something along the lines of IBM's Watson, like if that keeps evolving. Yeah. It, like even if it's not being the GM, you can basically have the GM like in the same sort of sense as like the HUD thing and everything's being run behind the scenes. As you're talking, you're saying this thing happens. It recognizes based on the context that, oh, they're meaning that this character is going to be fighting this one in this way, crunch the numbers based on the rules behind the scenes and tell you what the result is. Yeah. Well, I, I draw the line at that. And I, and, and I tell you why. I, I tell you that there will be no true version of that until we have a holodeck, because because mm. that's just well. There's there's already games that try to have a col- like ha- try to have a collaborative GM where essentially everyone is contributing to the story. Well, yeah, and so that's that's and, a different type of game kind, though. But that's kind of what I'm talking about. It's kind of bridging the gap between that. So that you can have this, like everyone is contributing in a way, and then the AI that fills in all of the gaps. So the idea is just to get. To get as close as you can with that with that AI, yeah, and give as much like player input will of course be needed some some along the way. And that's my point. But, the yeah, point is okay. is that we do that nowadays. Uh, Oblivion was not every rock wasn't designed. They use you know procedural generation to generate a lot of it, and then they tweaked a lot of it to make it more interesting, right? Yeah. Uh, but there's always well, that human well, element. Make so. it more. In- We're talking about Elder Scrolls, right? Yeah, we're you said make it more interesting. I don't know about that. Let's <laughs> back it off there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. So, uh, opinions of the gameplay <laughs> aside, there will always need to be that human element yeah. for tabletop role playing game, as far as I'm concerned. Well, Until human, you get the holodeck. Yeah. Well, the human you know. element is the players. See, that's the thing. If the players are, my, my idea is like this is very pie in the sky, but the idea is like the, the players are sort of determining what kind of story they want to tell anyway. In, in any sort of really great RPG campaign, the GM is flexible enough yeah. that you can get those experiences like the players burning down 
the village as they want to. So if you can if you can take that away, Bastards. where yeah, if we can take that away. Um, I spent an hour and a half <laughs> building that damn but, thing. But what if you didn't have to? What if what if you know you the players feed in to you know like you said with the Watson program, mm-hmm. if, you know the the the, uh, the audio suggestions from the player about the kind of things they want to do, mm-hmm. and you know the the AI could sort of craft. An experience based on that, and then change it based on the the player reaction to it. Well, this occurs. Okay, now in tabletop role playing, and I'll give you a perfect example. Back when we started playing role playing games, way back in the the dawn of time, the uh, the the GM used a lot of random stuff. I mean, random encounters, despite what some people say, are the heart and soul of role playing games because they don't just randomly throw a monster at you; they throw whole storylines at you. Let's say you're walking through the woods, and in the old days. You could get incredibly overbalanced encounters, okay? You're the first level guys, you're walking to the Caves of Chaos, and all of a sudden a dragon flies overhead, right? And yeah. it's like, you've got to have the knowledge and the and the wit to say, well, we ain't taking that on, we're going to hide behind a rock, mm-hmm. right? It, it really shouldn't take much knowledge for that, but yeah, some players are like, well, if it's in the game, i got to kill it. That's right, it's balanced, it's got to be balanced. <laughs> be balanced. Encounter. That's more of a today thing than back then. Yeah. But the, the idea was, though, is that that dragon now exists in this world. Mm-hmm. So the GM, it's, 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 it's the GM's job now to figure out what is going on with that dragon. So he puts that in the back of his mind. says, oh, we got a dragon now, so mm-hmm. maybe I should put a dragon's layer somewhere. Or maybe there's a village down the road that's being burnt to a frizzle or whatever. Mm-hmm. So those random encounters were turned into something big by a GM mm-hmm. who was much more intuitive and story-driven than an AI would be. So mm-hmm. with an AI... For now, you're going to get a bunch of you know random encounters. Yeah. Basically, like a poor GM rolling an encounter up, you meet a dragon, it kills you. Yeah. Again. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, it's 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 sort of that old, you know, that old um, goal, that old like you know, brilliant goal that we all that we all kind of talk about the story generation system mm-hmm. and something that I know I did one of my well, my master's uh, thesis project on was the story generation system, or at least. Um, the the very early beginnings of it, more of the more of a world generation system, I guess, than the story generation system. But it's it's taking that sort of concept and really fleshing it out so that we yeah. can have this this um, AI that is adaptive enough to give you that experience. But I agree with you that it is something that is that is far off. And I think the way to go about it is to look at what we have now and try to go as try to get it to the point where you can feed it as little as possible, which will probably still be a lot. There's probably yeah. still going to be a lot that needs to be fed into it. But the more responsibility that you can take away from uh, the GM and let it play out organically in the game, the better. The more that you take the numbers away yes. from it, yeah, there the go. more yes, acoustic to, the yes. experience yeah, That is a better way to put it. I agree. Becomes. That's a better way to put it. Yeah. And you, the more you hide the man behind the curtain. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Mm. Now, players, uh, like you said, players are a big part of that. GMs would be... Uh, had nothing if not for players and mm-hmm. players are a big part of that story thing when they go and burn down the village now I've got to figure out what the you know the consequences of burning down the village are which always ends up causing you know wailing and gnashing of teeth and <laughs> screams of derision at me for yeah. how dare you punish us for burning down a village <laughs> it's so, like well you know it just kind of makes sense cause and effect but you know like, but great stories come from those yeah. sorts of things what, but you mean this kingdom does it like it when their villages get burned down <laughs> and then they send like you know the army after you or like assassins after you, why would they do that? I this mean, this is unbalanced. Us <laughs> against an army. This is an unbalanced encounter. <laughs> but with a hybrid with a hybrid game, we could really do that as long as and, and I'll just go ahead and summarize. As long as it remains in the in the acoustic space. We're not talking over the internet. Mm-hmm. It's tabletop. You're around people. You take it with you to Gen Con. You play it in the car. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. You take it to the park. You play it in the park. You play it anywhere. You're not restricted by carrying around. Play it in the miniatures. bathroom. <laughs> Come on, we're all going to do it. Let's be honest. Not with other people. <laughs> well, not with other people. You could all be in your own stall lined up at work or whatever, you know. So. Okay, I'm splitting off from the party for a minute for uh, business. <laughs> yeah. uh, but as long as it stays acoustic, it stays portable, okay? And, and you're not chained to the internet or a computer, all right? <laughs> and as long as it has a very uh, uh, number-free interface, I think uh, that's the way we need to go. And uh, we need to convince people to go that way because, quite frankly, printing is expensive. As a person that's been mm-hmm. involved in the in the game industry for a while now, mm-hmm. printing books yeah. is ridiculously well, expensive. It's printing box games. Interesting little tidbit. I don't think you mentioned this, but mm-hmm. people might find it interesting to know you worked on the Doctor Who RPG. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I did definitely have a first-hand knowledge of building a box set and books and all that other kind of stuff. Who is this Doctor Who? 
Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. <laughs> uh, exist, sorry. Yeah, well, that's fine. Uh, and, and, you know, speaking back to what we were talking about, the difference between being creative and releasing stuff on time, and speaking of hybrid, I can rep all the, put all those together in one, one thing about Doctor Who. When I was building the Time Traveler's Companion, it was a box set originally, mm-hmm. and it was going to have a series of cards for determining TARDIS damage, for regeneration, stuff like that, right? Mm-hmm. And it was going to be a really full box, but uh, they decided to make it a book because books are cheaper. Okay, so I had to take and rewrite a bunch of stuff and redo all that. And even with that book, at one point, I'm like, the book has to go out, but I'm not done. It, there's still editing to do. We went three editing passes. There were still uh, typos, but you know, at one, some point, you gotta say, book's gotta go. Book's gotta go. Right? Mm-hmm. My creative, you know, drive, notwithstanding, all the pictures in that book. I remastered off of DVDs. I cleaned them up. I made them ready for print because when you're pulling off a DVD, it's, uh, yeah. it, it's, it's 72 DPI. It's not 300 print ready DPI. Right, right, so you've got to right. you got to really massage those pictures. But at some point, you got to stop massaging the pictures. Right? right. Uh, it's just not going to look like you wanted to. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I wanted to do with that is I was I, I tried to convince uh, Cubicle Seven. We need to build a TARDIS app for this thing, mm-hmm. okay? An app that takes care of all the TARDIS rules. This is a pretty chunky book, right? Mm-hmm. And the TARDIS is a complex machine. So what if they could just put in their coordinates mm-hmm. with their stats and then, you know, hit a few buttons and, you know, it does the thing and then, you know, if you uh, ended up in the right place or in a black hole, right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, all these things would have been really useful as a hybrid tool, but they really didn't want to invest the time and, and money in that because they're a traditional mm-hmm. company, right? right. They know print, mm-hmm. and they do print. Right. We need to move away from print. That's mm-hmm. my argument. And it saves the environment. <laughs> so I think what we're getting at is that if you are still printing out books and you're on paper, you are destroying the environment, I think, and I you're think a the, terrible person. I think the counter-argument is that the electricity and all the, uh, the rare earth metals used in making electronics is... No, we're, of we're, we're, we're ignoring that. We're ignoring that. <laughs> but how many books can you stick on an electronic device? True. And actually, that argument doesn't fly because uh, the pulp they make out of paper is uh, the dust that's left off from actually making lumber and stuff like that. They actually take sawdust and use that in the making of paper. So. Recycling. 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 Yeah. Recycling. yeah. <laughs> so that's. Uh, All right, I'm back on paper. Go paper. <laughs> but, anyways, I'm just saying that, you know, we need to, to, to move to that area. But, you know, I, I, yeah. All right. Well, um, although I love the small books, I think uh, I think we're we're getting ready to go ahead and uh, sign off for the evening. And we've had a pretty good, pretty productive discussion. Uh, Nathaniel, I'd like to thank you for coming out. Do you have any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Uh, <laughs> I can't think of anything off the top of my head. No. Your brain has uh, been, you've tilted over, and your brain has been leaking out your ear. Yeah, you we did this after work, so yes. you know most of me has been spent today. Uh, no, oh. Uh, Disney Infinity. That is that is a great game for a kid. I, I play that with my kid. All right, that. recommending Disney oh. Infinity. <laughs> I'm not right. a fan, but all right, all right, uh, Chris. Yep. So thank you everyone for joining us for the BackwardCompatible.com podcast episode number thirty-eight. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Nathaniel. And we'll see you guys next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, Backward-Compatible.com. You bring unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us what you'd like to see in digital analog hybrids, or if you want them at all. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.